Thank you for joining this webinar from Yellowstone Advisory. Today's company presenting is Brickability Group, who announced their half year results uh, last week. The numbers reported suggested the company has recovered strongly um, from the tough trading months in April and May. Um, and the strong improvement has continued um, into the second half. There is even talk of a V-shaped recovery, which I'm sure we'll all be interested to hear a little bit more about. While we're waiting for everyone to arrive, there is a poll up on screen, um, and it would be grateful if you could just indicate whether you are a shareholder or not. I'm just going to keep that poll up there for a few minutes longer. Um, but it looks like we've probably got 80% of people uh, online at the moment are non-shareholders and 20% are shareholders. So um, I'd just like to start by saying we're really pleased to have Chair John Richards uh, with us today and Gary Nangle from the Finance Department who are going to take us through these results. Before the presentation starts, I'd just like to go through a few points. You're all currently on listen-only mode. Um, but if you would like to ask a question, please uh, type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll handle all questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the format today is a presentation from John and Gary. It will last approximately uh, 20 to uh, 30 minutes. And as I said, we'll take um, all questions um, at the end of the presentation. Um, following the, uh, the session, uh, you'll be redirected to a short survey to give some feedback uh, on today's presentation and the company. It would be really appreciated if you could spend a few moments doing that. And now, without uh, further ado, I'd like to hand you over to John Richards, who is the chair of Brickability Group. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, all. Um, as Alex has said, John Richards. Uh, chairman of uh, Brickability Group. And I wanted to begin uh, just by telling you a, a little bit about the business. But, uh, Brickability began life in 1984. And at that stage, it was uh, a regional brick, distrib brick distributor headquartered in Bridgen, South Wales. Coming forward to today, it, it's very, very much more. We have a, a fully national coverage in our uh, brick distribution. We're the country's largest brick distributor. We're equally the country's largest towel radiator distributor. And if you look at the house on the page that we're sharing with you, you'll see that the business now extends to, to roofing products. Uh, in the case of roofing, not just roof tiles, but installation of roofing, uh, to cement fiberboard cladding, windows, everything to do with bricks, also towel radiators and regular radiators, fascias, soffits, guttering, internal, external doors and windows. We are not, however, a builder's merchant. We have um, products where we have real expertise, uh, real knowledge, real technical skills. So we have nine or 10 different products where we can give that, to offer that to our customers. We don't want to be a builder's merchant, with huge inventories, massive amounts of working capital tied up in those yards, in those inventories, and 1,200 product lines. We want our nine, 10 or 11 product lines where the route to market stays the same. In our case, it's just about all house builders, but we must have expertise in those areas. That's exactly uh, what we're known for. We move on. Alex referred to our first half of this year and April was difficult. Uh, it was a tough month for us just after the start of lockdown, but we returned just about to profitability in May. After May, each month during the first half, we produced EBITDA at or around uh, 2019 levels and in September it was just above 2019. As already has been said, the recovery that we've seen is V-shaped and it continues to improve, i.e. the side of the V coming out of recovery is actually getting better and better. Cost control within the group during this period has been excellent. We have very flexible costs. We don't have big plants uh, and machinery. We have a, a, a sales organization that to some degree is paid on results. So as the market contracts, uh, our costs uh, fall and, and vice versa. We're investing in a new 60,000, 63,000 square feet warehouse to expand our heating, plumbing and joinery operations and a startup business to which I'll come later. 
We implemented our COVID health and safety procedures rigorously, as you would expect, and our preparations for Brexit, whatever form uh, that Brexit might take, are, are, are extensive and are robust. Our acquisitions are being well integrated, and we are exploring more acquisitions, more of that in a while. We declared our dividend, and we have reinstated a full year guidance. If you look at our financial highlights in the first half, Revenue uh, down to uh, 75.3 million against 97.9 last year. Gross profit at 15.8 million compared to 19.1 last year. Adjusted EBITDA, 8 million versus 10.4 last year. Profit before tax, 4.5 million against 6.5 million last year. And an interim dividend declared of 0.8678 pence per share, which will be payable on the 25th of February 2021. What I would say with all of those numbers we, before we go on to the next page is that we probably lost uh, around about 30 trading days in April and uh, the start of May. I think this explains our, our recovery in, in a graphical way. The red line is our 2020 a group monthly sales in millions of pounds, millions of pounds on the vertical axis and the months on the horizontal axis. And you will see at the start of the year, January and February, indeed the start of March, it was looking very good. Once the general election was over in uh, December 2019, we did experience what I think was colloquially called the, the Boris bounce. It certainly happened to us both in order book and, and dispatches. But then of course the lockdown in late March, 23rd of March, I believe, and you'll see what happened to our dispatches after that. They fell very fast and they fell very heavily. But they've recovered very fast and very significantly as well, having made a small loss in April. We returned to some profitability in May and again, better still in June. And, and on from there, as I said earlier, our uh, monthly sales and our EBITDA has been there or thereabouts compared to 2019. And while it's past um, September, the same is the case in October, which we're very encouraged by. And the reason for that is can be explained by house building, and that's our main customer base. Now, these are only NHBC numbers rather than the whole of the house building market. The reason I'm using them is NHBC get their numbers out very quickly, and quite a lot of the house building market does not. They're, they're two quarters behind, whereas NHBC are on the ball with this. And you'll see that the forecast number of uh, starts in 2020 is moving down, but it's specifically because of one quarter. And you see for the right-hand graph, it's quarter two, 2020, where the number of starts is, is going to be around about 7,000, which is um, frankly about a quarter of what it is in, in some good quarters. But you'll equally see that quarter three forecasts are moving back up very quickly and uh, I would suggest it's going to continue to be the case. And what does that do to our sales? Well, if you look at the next graph, that's the market for brick dispatches, brick sales in GB. You'll note that um, 2018 was the strongest year uh, for some time, where about 2.4 billion bricks were used in GB. And of that 2.4 billion, 1.9 billion were those made in GB and 460 million were those that we import. The reason that the 1.9 million is as, as it is, is because at that stage, 1.9 billion was about the out and out capacity of every brick manufacturing plant operating in GB. I'm very familiar with that. I was at Ibstock uh, for 31 years. So no, most of what happens in GB brick manufacturing, if, if I may say. 2019 numbers not so very different, just down a little in GB produced sales and a little bit more in, in imported uh, sales. And this year, the forecast is 1.650 billion UK made brick sales and 310 million of imports. One of the interesting things to note, in my view, is that the proportion of sales in the country uh, that our imports is pretty much consistent year on year. A higher year for GB made bricks is equally a higher year for imports. They very much have their place in the market now. And the imports to GB are via two routes. 
Uh, one is via uh, the major brick maker, Wienerberger, that has a number of plants in Belgium and the Netherlands, where it brings bricks into GB. And then there are a number of specialist brick importing companies. There are about five that I can think of quite quickly, two of which, Crest and Bespoke Brick, are a part of the Brickability Group. And because of the importance of imports to our market now, we have acquired both of those over the last three years, both fully in integrated now. And indeed, Crest is one of the most profitable parts of our business. Let's move on to a few numbers. And I shall hand over to Gary to take you through some of those. Uh, just around, as John had said, we finished the half year at uh, 75 million. Um, but our gross percentage, our gross profit percentage remains strong and on levels just above where we finished the full year in March this year. And our EBITDA, we finished again 23% down on the half year compared to last year. But the adjusted EBITDA percentage remains consistent with the half year last year and also where we finished full year. Our divisional performance shows uh, what's already been explained with regards to the downturn in sales and the lockdown, but uh, all businesses have increased, uh, as John has just been through with the, uh, the V-shape um, as we go through the year and start to finish very strongly as we came to the half year. On the consolidated balance sheet, um, the current liabilities uh, have reduced significantly this half year. That's reflective of we had deferred some supplier payments for a few days at the end of the financial year to ensure our customers were paying. Obviously, we, we weren't very sure about what was going on. So that current liabilities number has decreased, but it reflects seven month end payments within a six month period. The non-current liabilities reduction reflects the deferred uh, consideration paid this year. I'd like to point out our um, bank debt reduced uh, eight and a half million in the half year. We drew down our bank debt at the end of March to ensure we had um, liquidity, liquidity going through March and April. Um, and we have already repaid 8.5 million of that. And the cash flow uh, statement is probably better on the waterfall chart here. Our cash at the end of 31st of March was 27.3 million. Operating profit 8.1, and we have a very strong EBITDA to cash conversion throughout the business. Our change in working capital, um, it's a large movement due to obviously the sales of, uh, fall in sales of March and also then full sales in September, which increased the debtor book. It shows our eight and a half million of repayment of bank debt, and obviously the deferred consideration payment of 6.4 million, taking our cash balance at the end of the uh, half year at 13.8 million. I'll hand you back to John to go through the acquisition pipeline. So at IPO um, in July, August, when we were doing our roadshow in 2019, we set out our strategy for acquisition to support the growth of this group. And they were gonna be bolt-on acquisitions. And we like to identify opportunities to get services and products that complement what we do now um, and offer service right across our national platform. Acquisitions could be geographic ex expansion into areas of GB, GB where we have a, a smaller footprint and whenever we do acquire, we like to retain existing staff and incentivize their management. At present, we're evaluating opportunities for extension in valves. We have um, a strong towel radiator and radiator business. They need valves, so we're looking to distribute those as well as the uh, radiators and towel rads that we distribute. Also in bricks and also in logistics to, to, to move those bricks around. In terms of outlook, the acquisitions that we've made are integrating very well into the group and they really are performing in line with expectations and in one or two cases, well ahead of expectations. We're progressing cautiously with a healthy pipeline of acquisition opportunities, but we have been being quite prudent and perhaps not rushing through these things at the moment. We wanted to just see 
what form uh, Brexit finally takes, and obviously what was going to happen with this second lockdown. So while we have a pipeline of acquisition opportunities, some of which could be completed and concluded very quickly, we're just holding back a little to see what happens. And furthermore, um, one or two of the things that we were pursuing, they were getting quite tight for cash and were looking to sell to us. And all of a sudden they got their bounce back loans and all of a sudden they deferred their VAT and so on and so forth. So we've been sitting on our hands waiting to see what happens when they repay those bounce back loans or they have to repay that VAT. And uh, so we're playing a waiting game with those. The fundamentals for our target market house building remain very strong. The, the need for more homes is well documented. The government continues to be supportive of house building. And for the first time in my working life at the election in December 2019, all the main political parties were very supportive of house building. In fact, they almost seemed to be out doing each other in their manifestos for who could be the most supportive of house building. But that's good. And it's reflective of what is needed. And I think it's further reflective of the fact that all political parties have at long last realised that a vibrant construction and house building industry is good uh, for the economy in general. Uh, the great guy who started and founded the Red Road business, Steve Morgan, once had his consultants calculate that just about three new jobs were created in GB for every extra uh, new house that was built. And they're impressive numbers indeed. On the 31st of March next year, Help to Buy comes to an end in its current format, but Help to Buy 2 is now there to replace it. And essentially, there are a few differences. Firstly, Help to Buy 2 only applies to first time buyers. And secondly, it does have some regional restrictions on the value of properties uh, for which, to which it can be applied. But nonetheless, there is Help to Buy 2, and it still enables young people to get on the housing ladder with just a 5% deposit. And that's very important indeed. We have to be aware that the stamp duty holiday comes to an end on the 31st of March. Well, at present it comes to an end there. We'll see if that gets extended or not. But what we do know is from the 1st of April 2021, the government scheme for affordable housing comes into play. Now that's 11 and a half billion pounds. Nearly all of that 11 and a half billion is new money. And it is expected from April 2021 to run for five years, 2026. And with that money, 180,000 extra affordable new homes will be built. That's around 35,000 per annum. And the ramifications for bricks, roof tiles, towel radiators, doors, windows, etc., are very, very positive indeed. Despite lockdowns, uh, it's clear that construction is expected to carry on. And that's certainly been the message from government that they want us to continue and indeed to raise the pace. The quality, uh, the demand for quality building materials will remain robust. And our order book books, I have to tell you, uh, do reflect this. And in one or two months lately, one or two of our divisions have had record ever uh, order intake uh, during the month. We are reinstating our market guidance. The financial year ended 31st of March, 2021. And we are currently anticipating full year adjusted EBITDA of at least 15 million pounds. Thank you. And I pause for questions. Thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, Gary, for that presentation. So we're now going to uh, go to, to questions. And as a reminder, um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, please just uh, type it in there and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. So just starting off now, um, first questions come in. There are brick manufacturers and there are house builders. Why do they need a distributor in the middle? Okay. It's a question we got asked quite a lot at IPO, I have to tell you, and, and there are very, very good reasons for it. As I said before, um, I was at Ibstock for 31 years, so I'm probably more familiar than most with the limitations of the sales and uh, servicing operations of brick manufacturers. When I joined the industry um, back in the mid 1980s, the brick manufacturers then, it wasn't as consolidated, nowhere near. There were almost about 300 people maybe, in their sales forces combined. And they had the wherewithal to call on an awful lot of people and give service to an awful lot of people in the house building industry. 
Today, that number of 300, all brick manufacturers combined in GB, is around about 70 people. That number of boots on the ground. Now, if you remember that uh, in Barrett David Wilson, there are 28 businesses. In Taylor Wimpy, I think there are 25. I could go on and on. But you're literally talking about hundreds and hundreds of businesses just in the major house builders alone, let alone all the regionals and the small business. And each of those has its site managers. It has its build managers. It has its buyer or chief buyer. It has its construction directors. And they all have to be seen. The manufacturers do not have the boots on the ground to do that or indeed do it adequately. But we do. We have over 130 people that we can put into play to serve those customers, and that's one of the strengths that we have. Manufacturers recognize that. That's one of the reasons why they use us. Secondly, we're very, very good at collecting cash. If the cash doesn't come in, our salesperson doesn't get the commission for that sale. It's quite it's that simple. Now, if you go to Ibstock or Forterra or Wienerberger, and I know because I've worked there, you have the sales side, small though it is, and you have the cash collection side, credit control. And they both do separate parts of the equation. They're not really linked very closely. In our business, it's one and the same. The salespeople have to collect that cash. We're very good at it. Manufacturers know we're very good at it. And that's why, or one of the reasons why they want us in play, because we make sure that they're paid on time, because we pay them on time. I think another advantage of manufacturers is they can come to Brickability Group, and if we just take bricks for a moment, we're Ibstock's largest customer by a long, long way. We're one of the top two with Forterra and, and Wienerberger as well. If we take Ibstock, they can come to us, and they do, and they say, right, we're going to make and sell 780 million bricks this year, numbers there or thereabouts. We want you to buy 110 million of them, and the split of those bricks is 20 from this factory, 10 million from this factory, 18 from this factory, and so on and so forth. And after a debate with Ibstock or their competitors, we make an agreement that we'll take that number between those factories, and we do take that number from those factories. Now, the advantage from a brick manufacturer is they know that you could take a factory, let's take Laybrook, which is in Sussex, it's an Ibstock factory, has a capacity of just under 40 million bricks a year, about 38. If they know that we are taking 19 million of that 38, it's a huge weight off their mind. They know how many bricks, which product ranges, what times of the year, and it helps them plan their business. And that, in turn, helps them save costs in terms of their factory production, which goes right through to their bottom line. We are of a scale and of a, a sales reliability that it brings a lot of strength and a lot of surety uh, to their operation. I think the other thing is that, again, most of the deals that Ibstock, or certainly Ibstock have with the big um, five house builders, where they sell some of their bricks direct, and they are um, Barrett David Wilson, Taylor Wimpy, gosh, Redrow, uh, Vistry, they don't sell much to Persimmon. But these are big numbers of bricks that are sold every year. And it's the cheapest part of the Ibstock, or for that matter, Forterra or Wienerberger pricing model. They don't want to sell any more than they already do in that pricing model because it upsets the overall and the balance and the mix of what they're trying to achieve in a given year. So with any manufacturer, their highest prices come from depot stock, where they stock in, say, Travis Perkins depots, just a few thousand of a particular brick for somebody building an extension, um, barbecue, bottom of conservatory, whatever. It has to match the existing brick. So whatever Ibstock charge that branch of Travis Burke is, they'll just stick 40% on it and put it in their yard. That's the highest prices that any brick manufacturer gets, fullest price. The second highest prices they get are from a prized architectural specification. The next highest prices they get are from a business like Brickability. All three of those are at the top end of Ibstock, Terra, or Wienerberger's expectations. The lowest prices they get, partly driven by that volume, volume, are from the big house builders. So they would not want a single brick more going through that channel because it cost them in terms of their average selling price mix. Let's carry on with that question and turn to house builders. 
House builders prior, prior to 2008, 2009 used to have significant buying departments. A typical region of any of them would have a chief buyer and two or three other people. Today, that's either one or two people. They absolutely got butchered during that recession and they've not restarted them. They don't have the time or the expertise, mostly time, wherewithal, to go to four GB brick manufacturers, five or six GB importers and see 10 different people. If they come to us, they can see everything. It's almost a one-stop shop for bricks and that's why they use us. As well as the fact we have significant expertise, as I said at the start of the presentation, in everything uh, that we distribute. And they rely on that expertise, whether it's takeoff volumes for the plans of the house that they have, whether it's getting the right bricks to them, because we know they'll get through the local authority planners, whether it's getting the right towel radiator there, uh, because we know they're planning to sell some of those units for uh, retirement homes. So the towel radiator has to have maximum temperature set into it so older people can't mistakenly adjust the thermostat over a certain temperature and burn themselves if they catch hold of it. All of those things we have the expertise to deal with. Manufacturers usually, rather than occasionally, don't. I hope long-winded, but it's an important question. I hope it answers. No, very comprehensive, John. Thank you for that. Uh, second question here is, uh, when you make acquisitions, you don't change the signage above the door. Do you move them onto central systems for things like finance and HR? OK, well, we, don't, we, we tend not to, to change the sign above the door. Um, I'll give you an example. Last year, we bought LBT facades, used to be called Lancashire Brick and Tile. Um, it only has strength in some parts of Lan Ma Ma Lancashire and in Manchester. But in those parts of, of Lancashire, it's headquartered in Bolton uh, and, uh, and northern Manchester. It has huge strength there. And they don't know Brickability Group PLC, but they do know LBT or Lancashire Brick and Tile. So it, it, it's not helpful at all for us to um, change the name above the door. In fact, we're rather proud that we keep it because uh, uh, we want to retain their often very strong local following. However, on financial systems, we do move people over. Uh, they use our central a a a HR facility. So while the name over the door doesn't change, the way that they operate uh, um, coming into the business centrally, that does change and we migrate them over, yes. Great, thank you. A question here on Brexit. What impact on margins would there be from a no deal Brexit? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, uh, the, 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 fortunately, the answer is that WTO tariffs on basic uh, building materials are a maximum of 2.5%. Now, the chief executive and I did a tour of duty in continental Europe some time ago, and we spoke to our, our suppliers of, of bricks and roof tiles in continental Europe. And they said to us, look, the maximum this is going to be if there's a no deal Brexit is 2.5%. We'll swallow one and a quarter, you swallow the other half, one and a quarter, and we carry on trading uh, as if uh, nothing had changed. Both continental bricks and continental roof tiles are having a price increase in January 2021. And so if it does prove to be that, I actually hope it doesn't, but if it does prove to be a no deal Brexit, we will just work that uh, slight increase for us as one and a quarter percent uh, into the price increase that we pass on uh, to our customers. It's important to note that we're hugely important to some of those European producers. If you take Murr Brick, family owned, the principal is Michael Murr, it's on the Netherlands German border. That particular factory has a capacity of 50 million bricks per annum. Last year, we bought 25 of those 50 million bricks in UK sizes. I suspect in 2021, it's probably going to be nearer 27 a million of that 50 million. So it's absolutely essential, not only for us and our customers in GB, but also for the Murr family, that they keep us as their biggest customer by some distance, and that every one of those 25 or hopefully 27 million bricks uh, continues to, to, to reach our shores. Okay. Thank you. And a sort of follow-up question on the acquisition funds is when you make acquisitions, can you improve their buying ability when they are part of a larger group with greater scale? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I'll give two examples. Uh, I mentioned Lancashire Brick and Tile, uh, LBT facades. Well, when we um, spoke to them about coming aboard, it became clear during our financial due diligence that they enjoyed rebates from the major uh, brick makers 
of between zero and 1% per annum. Uh, we enjoy rebates of between three and 5% per annum. And the instant, instant uh, one of those companies becomes part of this group, they benefit from our uh, higher rebates, which is very, very important for their margins. The second thing that I would say is that um, it also applies to our buying prices because while um, we get better prices or higher prices than perhaps um, a major house builder would, as I mentioned before, the fact is that because of our scale, we do get some advantages. We recently looked at a potential acquisition of brick distributor in the Southwest. And we worked out on average during due diligence that our buying prices were 25 to 30 pounds per thousand um, more advantageous than theirs. Uh, they also got a 1% rebate and we, for that particular um, manufacturer, got four. So at both ends, both the buying price and uh, the levels of rebate, our scale and our purchasing power does show, and yes, acquisitions become part of that very quickly. Interestingly, we acquired a business um, called U Plastics earlier uh, in this calendar year. And U Plastics are the country's largest distributor of hardy board, that cement fiber board that goes on the side of houses and sometimes looks like that black Essex boarding that you see. They also do uh, guttering and downpipes, and they're very, very major in those things. But from Hardy Plank, who make the Hardy, James Hardy, who make the Hardy board, they were actually a bigger distributor than we already were, were because we did distribute it previously. So while they got three or 4% rebates, we only got one. So bringing them on board, what we already did at Brickability Group suddenly added 3% rebate points. So it works both ways occasionally. Yeah. Uh, another sort of related question then on margin. Um, is the focus on affordable housing likely to lead to less premium product in the mix and thus lower margins? Um, you know, this will be a surprising answer, uh, but it's actually the opposite. Uh, you have to remember the financial model, the way this works is whoever's building it gets their money up front or well, in tranches as they go through the build. And uh, whether it's local authority housing or whether it's affordable housing stroke uh, um, housing associations, they really don't stint when it comes to specification and um, people shouldn't worry about that at all. If anything, they go to the premium end of what we have to offer. Got another question here on acquisitions. Um, has the pandemic presented you with many acquisition opportunities? What criteria do you use for making acquisitions? Okay, um, could I answer that, uh, that in two parts? Um, the first part is about the pandemic. Now, we actually thought it would. We were looking at one or two businesses, like I think one in particular, where when we'd spoken to them before, they were looking at a multiple of something like five, five point five and a half times EBITDA for the purchase price. And then they started talking to us as the pandemic began to take hold, first lockdown, of maybe four to four and a half times EBITDA. So we were rubbing our hands together, thought this might get better still. But all of a sudden, that business picked up uh, um, their, uh, their loan, um, their bounce back loan. They then deferred their VAT. They put half their staff on furlough and suddenly they had some cash in the business that they didn't expect to have. So um, we haven't gone back with higher offers. We're just sitting in our hands because if the business is still worth buying, one day that VAT will have to be paid. Those staff will be off furlough and one day their bounce back loan will have to be paid. So the bargains that we thought might materialize because of the government's support haven't materialized, but they might still do so. Second part of the question was, do we have uh, criteria on acquisitions? And absolutely we do, and they are very rigorous, and I'll just run through some of them. Firstly, we will not overpay. We won't enter Dutch auctions. If it's too much money, we will walk and have done so many times. We've had a number of examples of where a proprietor has uh, provisionally agreed a number with us and then has come back at the 11th hour saying that they want a little more. Well, we're the wrong people to do it to because we do walk. We won't overpay. We don't pay more than six times EBITDA. We don't pay more than 60% upfront with the rest deferred and contingent on performance. The businesses have to be profitable in the first place. We, we don't have magic wands. We don't claim we can walk into businesses and turn a poor business into a bad one, but we can take a, a good business uh, and make it better. The businesses that we acquire have to know and enjoy the same route to market. They have to have uh, good management. And if it's worth buying, I guess the implication is it probably does have decent management. 
And where we can, we retain that management nearly all the time because if they're good enough, why, why change them? And as I mentioned before, we tend not to change the name over the door. So uh, rigorous criteria, but thus far it has worked for us. Got an operational question here. Do you pick up the bricks or the radiators from a manufacturer and do the distribution? Okay, so um, most of the bricks that we distribute in GB are delivered by Ibstock um, or Forterra or um, Wiener Burgers. There's no point in double handling them. They go straight from their factories uh, to the site of use. Uh, as far as European bricks are concerned, uh, we have those picked up from the factories in continental Europe. They are imported with specialist transport companies to Harwich or uh, Tilbury, sometimes Dover, sometimes Gould further north, and then they're either put on stock, we have stockyards at those ports, or taken straight uh, to the site of use. When it comes to our tower radiators, they are imported. They come from Mish, Mish Makina uh, tower radiators, uh, Ish Makina tower radiators in Turkey. We are their largest customer worldwide, and they're packed into containers, and we get three or four containers every week arriving from ports uh, to our distribution warehouse. They're then distributed by courier from our warehouse to plumbers who uh, install them on site. We use couriers because our towel radiators business, if they are ordered by five or, at four o'clock on a given day, we guarantee to have them on site with the plumber by 12 midday the next day. Thank you. I think your answer to that has sort of answered this question, but I'm going to run through it again because it's a good point and you may wish to add something else. And the question is, your, your company is clearly playing an important role in the supply of bricks to the UK house building sector, easing the flow of stock to market and working capital issues of both OEMs and their ultimate customers. Brickability to this extent is playing the role of a traditional distributor, but does not appear to have millions of bricks sitting idle at sites. Please can you explain the brick procurement and delivery process and how you keep amounts of physical stock from becoming too large. Yeah, okay, well, the vast majority in the house builders, um, to give you an example, if you take um, uh, our biggest house building customer is Bellway Homes. Uh, Bellway might, they have about 270 sites operating around GB, but if we take a given site, anybody's local area, they might, might say, right, this is a 250 house site. Uh, we're using six different brick types and we want two loads of each of those six brick types delivered to site per month. There's no point in any sub distribution there. It's taken straight from, let's say, the Ibstock or Forterra factory and delivered on site to that Bellway site. That's the way the vast majority of our business works with bricks. We do, however, have a number of depots where we sell from stock, but they're very, very small fry. And I think we have about seven of them, um, uh, uh, mostly down the M4 uh, corridor. Tal radiators is a different model where we do keep, I think about 30,000 towel radiators in stock at any one time because there are lots of sizes. There are lots of colors. It's not just white or, or chrome. And uh, there are lots of outputs and so on and so forth. Some are um, hot water towel radiators, some are electric and some are fuel fuel as it were. So we need to keep those in order to fulfill our promise of next day delivery. But our inventory across the group and for a business that in a normal year now will be close to a 200 million pounds of turnover, um, we're keeping uh, between nine and 10 million pounds of inventory in total. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned 180,000 new build houses. Approximately how many bricks uh, is that? Uh, that extra 180,000, gosh, that's a good question, of affordable homes. Assuming that 90% of them would be clad in brick, and I say that because in England and Wales, 90% of all new build homes are clad in brick. It's less in Scotland because there's a lot of stone and render used there. One should assume it to be between an extra 200 and 200 million bricks used in GB per annum. Thank you. Who do you consider to be your main competitors? Okay, that's a very good question. Well, it's certainly not builders merchants. There are probably two businesses of scale that I would mention. One is that we have about a 14% market share of all bricks distributed in GB. The next largest is a company called Taylor Maxwell. It's owned by its management. It's headquartered in Bristol. 
and they would have around about an 8% market share of bricks distributed in GB. And there's another part of their business similar in scale, which is a timber distributor. There is a slight difference with Taylor Maxwell. They do have national coverage. They are long established. But one of their main focuses of end use is architectural specification, commercial and industrial use of bricks. Ours tends to be house building. So while we're the two biggest you know, distributors in GB, we have slightly different end use um, priorities. Third business that could also say to be a, um, not national, but a significant um, brick distributor is part builders merchant and part brick distributor. They are only strong in the West Midlands, Staffordshire, East Midlands and London, Northern Southeast. It's called E.H. Smith. It's a family owned business headquartered in Solihull in the, in the West Midlands. While it's not a national player in bricks, in those areas it is very strong and their market share would be around four to five percent. And they are, we're the three biggest. Thank you. How does your profitability compare with that of a traditional builder's merchant? And is there anything you can learn from the success of a company like Howden, which supplies kitchens, et cetera, to the building trade? Okay, um, our margins would on brick tend to be not dissimilar to um, a builder's merchant because while they sell at relatively low margins, if they ever sell direct to site, they do make very good margins or at least should do when they're selling from their depots. Last time I had a look at a Travis Berk Perkins branch with, uh, with John Carter, actually used to be this uh, CEO, it was not unusual for a, a TP branch to be making between 28 and 40% on sales out, out of depot, which is not dissimilar to our sales out of depot in the few branches that we do have. But on direct to site bricks, their margins would be would be probably similar. On other products where we have them in our warehouses, our margins are much greater. And that is because we have a very low cost, simplistic build, business model. I could take you to our warehouse where you'd find about five people working. And from the order coming in electronically from a plumber today and being taken out by a courier tomorrow, tomorrow morning, there's a, pick, a, a picking note issued at the warehouse is prepared for dispatch and it gets picked up by a courier either later in the day or first thing in the morning for dispatch tomorrow. It's a very, very low cost model. We don't have regional distribution centers. We don't have branches with their own manager, with their own counter people, with their own yard people. Um, it's a very, very less expensive model with far, far fewer uh, fixed costs. There was a second part of the question, Howden, Howden Joinery, Howden Timber. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I'm not actually very close to that business, but I, I'm close to some of the other kitchen manufacturers like Amiga and like Symphony. And rest assured that all the time we look at what they're doing with their end use, which is the same as ours and house building, as you know. And uh, we do pick up a lot of things, not just the business model, actually, but sometimes businesses like that are very, very good at displaying and promoting their product with well, not actually swatches, they're not on paper, but with samples of their worktops, samples of their handles, samples of their drawers, even of the carcasses and so on and so forth. So yet we're, um, we're willing to learn from anybody, but we're particularly willing to learn from people who operate in our space or any, even related to our space. Thank you. Could you talk about the potential for growth in the areas you operate in outside of bricks? How fragmented are complementary markets and do they exhibit any significant growth potential? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. There, there are, there's still an awful lot of fragmentation. Heating and plumbing is incredibly fragmented. Internal doors is incredibly fragmented. Windows, um, timber windows, possibly even more so. Timber windows, you've got anything from a decent local joiner uh, to uh, um, gelled when, for example. Uh, with doors, you've got a little uh, local joiner uh, right up to Prem door. So um, lots of small people where a consolidation uh, could be um, a, a real target. And heating and plumbing, it really is one of our targets. One of the other areas we're looking at, and this is not so much acquisition, but organic growth. And that is the area of ceramic tiles. 
Um, ceramic tiles is very, very fragmented. You'll all be familiar with Topps tiles. You'll all be familiar with Porcelainosa. But there are any number of smaller ceramic tile makers who are um, importing or making, making in GB or importing from Spain, importing from Italy. So there are, are great opportunities there. One of the amazing things that we found out recently, and um, I've met the owner, fam, head of the family, from a business in Italy, we, uh, from India, where we do actually buy uh, some bricks, imperial size bricks to match the ones that were used in GB 150 years ago, 100 years ago, suddenly found out they had eight ceramic tile plants in India. So we sent out people to have a very good look because one of the things um, we're very keen to make sure is that A, that their technology is of the finest, and B, that their adherence to health and safety and environmental issues is of the finest, and perhaps most important, to make sure the way they treat their staff is of the finest. We do an audit before we'll deal with anybody that way. But we send our people out and they actually pass with flying colours in all areas. It was very, very impressive. But here you have um, a seven factory ceramic tile maker with everything from the highest end, so way above Porcelainosa's best, right down to the cheapest range at Topps Tiles and everything in between of the very highest quality and the most incredibly competitive prices that currently do absolutely diddly in the UK. Nothing here at all. Um, well, watch this space. <laughs> we will with interest. Got a specific question here on the financials. Why did the gross margin rise in the first half? Um, number of reasons for that. Um, one of the things about our lockdown was that companies like Ibstock shut an awful lot of factories. At the time they had 19, they've, they've closed three since, but they had 19 and initially only three of them stayed open. Same with Forterra to a degree and same with Wienerberga to a degree. So for the bricks that we were supplying in late May and June and July, there was a slight shift to a few more imported bricks in the mix during that period because we couldn't get everything we wanted from the GB manufacturers and our imported bricks have a significantly, significantly higher margin. I think secondly, our towel radiator margins are absolutely top notch. And when major house builders first came back to work, they were focusing on finishing off houses that already had walls and already had a roof on. And that's where towel radiators were getting used a lot so they could complete houses and get them sold fast from their existing shell and, 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 and roof stock. So a few more towel radiators than perhaps you would have expected. And again, their margins are higher than um, GB brick margins, GB made brick margins. We should expect that to equalize back to its usual levels when business is back absolutely to normal. Thank you. Question here is, what is the financial condition of the Turkish towel rad manufacturer? Um, it's good. Uh, clearly, you, you, you'd expect that um, we're, we're very tight at watching that. Uh, we, we pay for our product in uh, pound sterling, and um, we have the, the Turkish lira has become quite strong during this year. Um, so it's costing us a little bit more, but we're so important to that factory, they've actually increased our rebate a little bit to, to assist so our margin uh, isn't affected. But they're in a good cash position, they're well funded, and um, they're a very impressive partner. Great, thank you. We've just got a couple more questions. As a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, please just type it into the Q&A box at the uh, bottom of the uh, screen. Question here, could you talk about the new warehouse and plans for uh, future warehouses? Yeah, so we've actually, uh, we're buying it. Um, warehouse is incredibly hard to come by. A, a number of, uh, uh, of uh, the watchers uh, on, on your webinar, Alex, may be aware of it, but good warehousing is really, really hard to get. Uh, it, it, it's, it's expensive because of that. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to buy it, because this is going to go up in value very significantly as, a, as an asset that we own. Our current warehousing, we have some in Corby, uh, which we rent, and some in Maidenhead, which we own. And I think Maidenhead is about 20,000 square feet, Corby, something similar. But we want one central warehouse, and they're not, we've probably got about 35,000 square feet altogether dotted around. This has 63,000 square feet. So we're gonna put all our towel radiators into there, but it does leave some extra space 
uh, for tau radiators to grow, which we believe it can and shall, and it leaves extra space should we uh, decide to follow uh, the Indian ceramic tile business up and start um, selling that to our customer base. Who knows, we might even find some of those uh, finding their way into that warehouse. And it will be a very good logistic point uh, from which to distribute. The current owner of the warehouse, uh, while they're moving their warehouse, they like the offices on the site very much. We don't need them. So we're going to rent 50,000, um, 10,000 square feet of, of office space back to them, which, which will helpfully bring in some money. There aren't plans for any other further warehouses at present. There's no need. But the warehouses we own in Maidenhead, before we sell them, we are uh, evaluating a plan to put a new branch of U Plastics, that's the Hardy Plank business, the guttering and downpipe business, into that premises. That business park already has uh, a tool station. It already has a door warehouse. They're nothing to do with us, of course, but it does bring good passing trade. And U Plastics is the acquisition. When I said some of them, most of them have gone very well. One or two have been exceptional. U Plastics is one of the companies that's been exceptional. They have two branches, branches currently, both in East Anglia. They would like to have a branch uh, somewhere around the M25 area. And this Maidenhead premises would be perfect for them. So we're just evaluating very rigorously. But if it's the right thing to do, we'll open a branch there. Thank you. We've just got two more questions um, here. The first one is on the dividend. Could you talk about the dividend policy? Yes. Um, when we went through our IPO last June, July, around our roadshow, we had some of our uh, investors were interested in um, a result that was growth oriented and some of our invested investors were interested in a result that was income oriented and, and some had an interest in both. So we tried to please all parties, but we said consistently at the time uh, that we would have a dividend policy where we um, aimed uh, to distribute 40% uh, of our free cash, which comes to about £6 million per annum. And we have just acted on that because uh, that would come to about £6 million per year, as I say, and we're just distributing with the dividend we just announced, um, £2 million of that, um, which one third, which is payable um, end 25th of February 2021. Thank you. We've got a couple more questions that have come in here. The first one is on the currency risk. Does the company use hedging or similar instruments to protect against adverse movements in sterling? And does brickability export at all? Um, OK, latter part of the question first. We, the only place we export to, we do do some business in the Republic of Ireland and do send some things across the, the water to, 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 to Northern Ireland. But yes, um, we do. Firstly, we, we buy our euros ahead and, uh, and, and do some hedging with that. But secondly, the way that we price our imported bricks and roof tiles to our sales force is we actually don't tell them what the real cost of importation is. We build in a healthy margin already so that we, we do have a buffer um, should there be any currency changes between the point of take, agreeing an order and when we actually get paid for it. So yes, we hedge. Yes, we buy ahead but there's a significant buffer in there all the time anyway. Um, as far as our tower radiators, which is our biggest single import is concerned, I think, as I said before, we buy those in pounds sterling. Okay, thank you. There is a growing use of structural timber products. Do you have any involvement in this area and is it a potential growth area? Um, that's a very good question. We haven't gone into timber thus far. I mean, I mentioned at the start, one of the things that we really want to do is to make sure that as well as offering product, we can offer experience and technical skills and expertise. And this is one of the reasons why we're not a regular builders merchant. We haven't come across uh, a timber business that's looking to be up for sale that has all that. And one of the reasons for that is, as I'm sure a number of, or many of your attendees will know, timber has enjoyed a fantastic year in 2020. Because so many people during lockdown were putting in decking or uh, repairing their um, garden fences or putting up garden fences or putting up timber structures in their gardens to make a garden office and so on and so forth, that those sorts of timber business have had a fantastic year. So there haven't been that many up for, up for sale. But if structural timber and certainly timber frame housing continues to grow, and there are evidences in places that it does, because you've got the 
factory that's part of Persimmon in North Birmingham. That's got bigger and bigger. There's a company called Wesley Developments who had West Frame. They sold that into countryside. That's got bigger and bigger. And of course, north of the border in Scotland, structural timber is, is huge. We haven't had anything put in front of us, but if it's into house building, we have a very open mind if it's that route to market and if our other criteria are met. Thank you. We've got two last questions here and I think we've probably got time for them. So we'll see what we can do. Firstly, have the problems that Fraser Simpson been resolved? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, there were a, a number of issues there, not least the very experienced managing director Gosh, about a year and a half ago? Yeah, just over two years. Uh, two years. Um, got a very, very quick uh, diagnosis of, of pancreatic cancer and died very quickly after that, completely out of the blue. And he was very much the face and the driving force behind that business. As And as I'm sure many people know, we, that sometimes can take the heart out, out of a business for a little while. Furthermore, we had one and then another of our uh, window suppliers in Poland go bust on us which was um, was not easy and thirdly while we had a, a fine um, manufacturer of very high quality uh, upmarket internal doors in Spain when stamp duty went very very high on very expensive properties then the market for building those properties in Wentworth, Ascot, St George's Hill, Weybridge etc etc that dried up and so did our orders for those doors. Time has moved on New management in there, it's working well now. We have two new timber window suppliers who are providing very high quality, very competitive and very reliable. With the stamp duty holiday this year, Wentworth, Ascot, St George's Hill, et cetera, et cetera, that's starting to come to life again. So we're getting more orders once more for our San Rafael doors, the high quality ones imported from Spain. And at long last, we have secured uh, the distribution rights of a fabulous uh, range of doors again, um, right across the, the board, not very cheap, not the 30 quid door you'll buy in Wix or B&Q. We started about 65, 70 pounds, and we go up to probably about 150 pounds per internal door with this range. But what it means is where we couldn't quote for Barrett or for Redrow or for Barclay um, or for uh, Bellway with internal doors, now we can. So the fortunes of, of, of Fraser Simpson as part of that FSN doors, are beginning to revive and they're beginning to revive very quickly. Right, thank you. And the last question is about your shareholder base. Wondered if you could say a little bit about it and how has it changed since the IPO and who are the big individual shareholders? Okay, well, um, first of all, about 55, nearly 56% of the shares are, are held by management. Um, the two largest ones are the CEO, Alan Simpson, who is the founder of much of what is in the business. And a, another manager who's on the management board, not the main board, uh, um, Paul Hamilton, who is the guy who runs the towel rad uh, business. Between the two of them, uh, they have over 30% of the shareholding. Um, others of the directors have significant shareholdings. I have 3%, and there are quite a lot of directors who have numbers that are uh, 1% and 2%, many of which were gifted those um, by Alan Simpson uh, as shares in Brickability when it was a private company. As far as our significant shareholder base is concerned, uh, we have Lion Trust, who are just over 11%, Otis Capital, uh, 5 BlackRock, 46 We also have uh, Canaccord, our significant shareholders, Quilter, uh, Ruffer. And the only, the only shareholder I can think who came in at IPO but sold relatively quickly afterwards that I can recall off the top of my head is Soros. But we have had one or two... Um, businesses that have come in quickly and gone out quickly if they've either taken profits or some business, I guess, during the downturn post lockdown have had to balance their overall portfolios. But, um, well, I hope that answers the question. That is great, John. Thank you very much for that. And that actually brings us to the end of this uh, webinar today. So thank you very much, John and Gary, for presenting so clearly and, and answering those all of those questions. Thank you to uh, everyone for attending today. I'd just like to mention that as you leave today's webinar, you will be redirected to a survey. And again, just to remind you, we really do appreciate that feedback. So if you could spend a couple of moments filling that in, that would be great. Also, just to mention that our next webinar is uh, next week uh, when we have 
Sainsbury's Head of Investor Relations uh, presenting after their half year results. And finally, if you have any questions that haven't been answered today and want any further information about any of our future webinars, please email info at yellowstoneadvisory.com. Thank you once again for attending and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.